seem to be not particularly humane in here. Hello again. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about you, but I just can't get enough of the War of Independence. Um, we're here for our first panel discussion, and we had obviously the ambassador here this morning, Dan Mulhall, but there's one person who is more important in Irish-British relations than the ambassador, and that is the Irish Times London correspondent. And we have the former London correspondent of the Irish Times, who's now the news editor, uh, Mark Hennessy, with us here today, and he's going to chair this panel discussion. And I am going to hand over to him now to introduce himself and his guests. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for sticking with a long day. And I think you will all agree, I hope, uh, that it has been a remarkable uh, festival. And the areas of discussion have been far broader uh, than people have thought. Um, it was quite striking listening to people in advance uh, talking about the way in which um, uh, Peter Hart uh, wouldn't be discussed and then to discover that uh, Peter Hart has been discussed at every available opportunity. Um, so I think that says a lot for the uh, openness of the debate and hopefully we'll continue that uh, for the next hour and a half, uh, obviously in a spirit of uh, fair-mindedness and, uh, and good manners. Uh, but no doubt it will uh, get uh, ro robust uh, on many occasions. Now, our panel uh, is uh, a distinguished one, as you would expect. Uh, you've heard from David Fitzpatrick uh, earlier and uh, from Eve Morrison and also from uh, William or Barry Sheehan, uh, all of whose uh, contributions have been uh, well to the standard that one would have expected from all three. And then we have Kevin Myers, who has uh, long since been a major force in the world of Irish journalism, uh, from his days in the Irish Times uh, to his columns in the Irish Independent and in the Sunday Times, and all of his uh, numerous other works as well. So my uh, only role here is to try and get a discussion going as quickly as possible. And I would like to start, if I could, with a question to the panelists, which in terms of the issues that have been raised by other people today that have actually provoked thought amongst themselves in a way perhaps that they might not have expected. And if we could take those questions from, uh, from Barry onwards. Just in terms of what you've heard today, is there something that you've heard that has made you think about the subjects that you've dealt with for years in a, in a way that has perhaps even surprised yourself? Um, I think one of the things is your contribution, Eve, which is the idea of memory studies. Um, memory studies is, is, of course, something that uh, you know you apply to. So I mean, I think that, that uh, and the some of the evidence that, that you were using, often historians can kind of discount the kind of locally collected interviews and, and things like that, particularly when they're anecdotal or very anecdotal. But I think what you showed is that there's still evidence to be kind of taken out of them uh, and to use in terms of trying to actually because what we're trying to do, uh, David said as well, is to recreate, you know, to try and reanalyze, to try and come to a conclusion based on evidence. And so that kind of evidence, which I probably wouldn't maybe have looked at so much before, I think I can safely say now I'll take another look at, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, for me. Well, I, t I tell you, I always learn something at, at uh, history conferences and festivals. It's very, it'd be very, very I, I don't, you know, because just when you get that sort of exposure to such a range of, of different perspectives and works, you always pick stuff up that you didn't know. That's one of the best reasons to go. I mean, I suppose in terms of today specifically, I mean, actually a lot of it was like the, uh, all the, all the, you know, all the statistical analysis were very interesting. I, I can't say that I was able to follow some of the more, some of the more detailed ones, but overall, I think it's very interesting, very interesting approach. And also, I think Barry's work in terms of, 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 of looking at the War of Independence period from a, a, a military perspective is, is really, he's the first person who's come along since, since Charles Townsend who's um, beginning to take on this issue and looking at, the, I suppose it was Sean A who wrote the Kill Michael Battlefield study as well, but who's beginning to take on the War of Independence in, in, in a less uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, the way a, an army would look at it, or a military man would look at it, and then comparing it with 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 um, with other uh, conflicts elsewhere, and I think it's very fruitful because sometimes Irish history, often Irish history, is looked at too too uh, in too much in isolation. David, well, um, I was very interested in Eve's 
We're, we're all being very nice to each yeah. other. <laughs> it's not going to last. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're yeah. Um, uh, very interested in the idea of guilt uh, as a theme, a major theme in the social memory of the revolution, and that even those who espoused uh, Republican views and, and had great respect for what was done in the War of Independence uh, seemed to exhibit signs of guilt, uh, which we can set against the emotion of anger, which Roy so eloquently uh, um, developed yesterday. And that guilt was evident in the hovering of ghosts of, of uh, victims over the, uh, the deathbeds of, of their uh, perpetrators over the um, deathbeds of their victims. So guilt, I think there's mileage in guilt uh, as a factor in the social memory of the Irish Revolution. And also with William or Barry or Finbar, which... Uh, uh, Barry. Uh, in Barry's um, account of picturing the uh, National Army's campaign in the Civil War as a proxy war, although I had problems with it, I, I think it's, it's a very useful way of redescribing and reconfiguring uh, um, one interpretation of that very perplexing episode, which is going to be so to the forefront in the commemorative program uh, within the next five years. And Kevin? Yes, I'm at a disadvantage because I wasn't able to get down till lunchtime, so that I'm not able to comment on an awful lot of the papers that you will have heard and the rest of the panelists have heard. But I, I was much taken by David's um, graphs. Um, uh, the, the, of the showing the decline of, of Protestants because that is going to have to take a lot of digestion. Uh, there's a lot of work there and it's quite clear that the events of 19... Um, obviously the, the Home Rule crisis before the Great War had a, a propellant effect on Protestants which I hadn't been aware of, or the acuteness of which I hadn't been aware of, but um, the exodus of Protestants after 1919 to which I had attributed in large part the violence that had occurred, obviously it's not as simple as that. And we obviously are going to be discussing that, presumably, as the, the talk continues. But that does um, supply a corrective to those who see um, the exodus as being largely caused by, by uh, violence. That clearly isn't the case. There are many factors, nay Tamaray, of course, being one. But um, the simple fact is that, um, as you said in 18, just before the famine, 45% of all weddings in, the, in Ireland were of the Church of Ireland or Protestant, and that within a century that was 10%. That's a rem something like that. Yeah, 45% yeah. of all the Protestant weddings yes, were yes. in the South. Yes, in the South. South. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, a, that's a, an extraordinary figure that it will take a lot of uh, contemplation. That's, that's my contribution. Okay. Right, we'll uh, throw it open to questions. Now, I don't for a moment want to sound patronising, but women are not asking questions, so could we perhaps uh, get a contribution uh, from uh, the female side, uh, and more than one, preferably? Um, I'm sorry, yes, and my second point is, uh, would people please identify themselves? You know everybody uh, who is sitting here, so let's do the courtesy the other way around. And the gentleman here with the glasses... My name is Tom Hickey. I just wondered, would we have got our freedom without the War of Independence? Who would like to? Barry? Uh, <laughs> I suppose you have to, de to define freedom probably first. I mean, you know, that's, what, what is that, what is that in, a, in a political sense? Or, or, uh, you know, um, I think um, we were on a pathway to probably dominion status anyway. I mean, if we had a parliament in Dublin, that would have evolved and grown over time in the way that the parliament we did get did evolve and grow over time. Um, and so I, I think that, and a lot of the British uh, elite, even Churchill, and they were quite comfortable with the idea of a kind of home rule parliament. I mean, you can take the Scottish example and the Scottish drive for independence now. So I think we... It would have been longer. We might be just about doing it now, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, I, I think that our, Ireland would have probably set itself on, on, on that path anyway. And I think even in giving us a home rule parliament, I think there was an understanding that that would evolve and grow over time. And, you know, 
the British had the experience of of losing the, the American thing, so they did take a different attitude to Canada and Australia and, and New Zealand. And um, so, I would say it. I mean, it's counterfactual history, but I, I would think we we probably would have got something. Uh, well, we've just got something now, don't we? I mean, you know, we we have the EU, which may, you know, which, so we're part of a supranational group, I suppose. Um, so, um, again, it's all a case of definitions, you know. So, anyone else, David? Well, I think there's one little problem which hasn't gone away, and that was Ulster. And uh, you know, why was a measure of freedom not given before 1914? Because of the determination of Ulster Protestants to reject home rule. So if you hadn't had an Easter Rising, um, you would have had something else before you got home rule. There would have been some sort of conflict, uh, whatever measure the British government had taken. They tried to impose 32 county home rule, they would have had a revolution, and a really serious, bloody revolution, uh, conducted by Ulster Unionists and Orange Men, who would have put up, I would suggest, uh, a pretty formidable antagonist uh, in Ulster to the British government forces. Or um, uh, if, you know, again, going into speculations, if, if uh, they had been accommodated, Ulster Unionists, you would probably have been faced with some sort of revolution um, of a nationalist kind. I can't see that there would have been a simple, seamless, gradual movement towards freedom in the absence of the 1916 convulsion which generated via tortuous path the war of independence um, but it's very difficult to say what, you know, what, what alternative path would have occurred except say a good deal of blood would have been shed before you embark on a war you have to ask yourself a number of moral questions. These questions go back to Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine. Is your methodology moral? Do you have just cause? Is there a peaceful alternative? And finally, and perhaps most important, can you win? And there is no way that anyone who began the process of violence to achieve a republic in 1916 could have said that the treaty in any way fulfilled the aspirations and requirements of the men and women of 1916. The British retained the treaty ports. The uh, British retained the oath of allegiance. The British retained Ireland within the Commonwealth. The British retained Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. And most important of all, there was never any possibility of Ireland, the Irish Republican Army, winning a guerrilla war against the British Empire. All guerrilla warfares ultimately come down to a war of resources. And the British not merely had the willpower to maintain their empire, they also had the resources to do so. And one of the reasons why the war lasted so long, in 1921, is that the British had wars all over the place after the settlement of, uh, in Versailles and the other settlements associated with the Versailles Agreement. Just to give you a perspective, over the period January the 21st, 1919, the date of the Solihad Beg ambush, and July the 11th, 1921, the date of the ceasefire, 687 British soldiers were killed in Iraq. 693 were killed in Egypt. 716 died in India, 273 in Russia, 219 in Turkey, 189 in Palestine, and in Ireland, now admittedly we're not including RIC and RIC auxiliaries and the new police called the Black and Tans, 
177 soldiers were killed in Ireland on duty between the start of hostilities and the end. The figures I've given you illustrate the strength, the British military strength that was available for crushing the re rebellion revolution in 1921-22, which would have been unleashed in 1922 had the uh, peace talks in London not concluded a sort of peace with the sacrifice of most of the aims of 1916. If you cannot win a war, do not embark on it. The cost will be too high. Cost, uh, the moral cost will be too high. The economic cost will be too high. And the outcome is you will have a generation of bitter, disappointed people, which is precisely what happened in Ireland. Ireland became a broken, dissolute, disappointed place because none of the goals which were achievable anyway, would have, were achievable, they weren't achievable, came close to being realized. That's a very long answer to your question. Um, could Ireland have achieved what we've got today? I don't know. I really don't believe in alternative histories. The history we've got is the history we've got. I have, throughout my life as a, a journalist, been a Redmondite. But I do not know if the Redmondite um, position might not have ended in, in appalling bloodshed. I do not know what would have happened had um, someone tried to enforce home rule on, on the Ulster Volunteer Force and, and, and Ulster, Ulster Generally. So um, the history we've got is the history we've got. But the, the, moral is, the moral of the story is do not embark on a war that you cannot win. That was true in Ireland in 1919. At Solihull Beg, it's true in Ireland in 1970 when the Provisional IRA began their campaign. Eve? Okay, I wasn't going to... Uh, say anything on this question? I am now. Um, I don't. So, so, and 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 uh, and I just. Uh, I said in the morning. I believe in being fair-minded, and I'm going to stick to that as much as I can. Um, now, I, I and I don't. I agree. The the thing that I do agree with Kevin about actually is that as is, is is I don't really like counterfactual speculation very much because it's very hard to tell. Although in a general way, I do agree with David that I think it's very hard to see how. Uh, some the, uh, uh, like a home rule solution or a self-government solution for Ireland could have happened without some sort of conflict. Whether it would have happened, uh, it would have been a, a you know a rebellion in in the north or the south. I think that that was kind of inevitable. The thing about defeating the British Empire, the problem is with guerrilla war. Uh, yes, you, you know the guerrillas don't have the firepower by definition. That, that regular armies do, okay? The Viet Cong didn't have the firepower that the Americans did in the Vietnam War, I'm sorry, you know, and, they, and the Americans still lost. Because, and so the problem is, with a guerrilla war, the, the, you know, it's less, it's, it's, it's less important whether uh, uh, an action was military successful it's, uh, as, as the political impact that it had. And so, and so the, the important, important thing about the, the IRA's uh, campaign during the War of Independence was first of all, no, they didn't win. They didn't lose either. And they managed to, to, to very successfully on the propaganda front undermine British, the, the, the Britain's arguments that they were the legitimate rulers of the country. They undermined it not only in this country, but in their own country. Because yes, they could have, the black and tans could have come and, and done a scorched earth policy and, and, and defeated the IRA. All right, but they would, but but it would have had, I would say, quite a catastrophic effect on the, the the their public support at home, because people were very were horrified in Britain uh, about what what the Black and Tans were doing as well. So what they so so what the the, the Republican campaign did very successfully uh, on the world stage as well as within the British Isles is that it it it, it did politically undermine. Britain in terms of being uh, legitimate rulers and in, in that sense they certainly did defeat Britain and the empire and, it, and, I, and I think and I actually think that, 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 that what happened uh, in Ireland although people don't talk about it enough did have an impact particularly within the rest of the British empire on, on, on people who want on uh, Indian nationalists in India who wanted independence and in different parts of the British empire they were watching Ireland very closely and it's nonsense to say they weren't and the fact that 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 that, that, um, that uh, the Republicans got as much as they did, 
and uh, is, is, is within the context of the British Empire at the time, you know, a really formidable achievement. And I actually think that that's the way you should look at it. So I, because I, so I think, okay, go ahead. Well, no, that seems <laughs> to be addressed to me. Um, the the uh, events in Ireland had nothing to do with the events in India in um, 1915, one year before the rising, the Lahore conspiracy trial when uh, over 200 Indians were um, charged with sedition. Uh, 42 were found guilty, sentenced to death, and were executed. Another 100 Indians were exiled for life. Uh, in, in Singapore, Indian troops mutinied and killed a number of civilians and um, British soldiers, and 47 Indian soldiers were executed in 1915. Now, the Indian Congress movement predates Sinn Féin. So, whereas the narrative certainly exists that the Irish resistance to the British imperialism, and Eva's quite right about one aspect of British imperialism that I'll come to in a second, uh, Indian nationalism had already taken a coherent and cogent form. If you put together the executions are in India in 1915 alone, they exceed the executions in Ireland by Crown, the Crown forces, the legal executions, never mind the extrajudicial murders um, of um, 1919 to, to, to 21. There is an issue which I didn't raise when I first addressed this um, issue. Um, it is the way imperialists fight their war. Now, I mentioned Iraq. In, in August 1920, uh, uh, a column of British soldiers was ambushed by Iraqi insurgents. 200 um, insurgents, 200 British soldiers were captured, about 100 were killed, another 100 were, were murdered. That single operation, that single two days, exceeds British Army military casualties in Ireland from 1919 to 21. The point is that then the British unsheathed the imperial sword. Now, relatively speaking, up until uh, 1920, but before, up until Bloody Sunday and um, the, um, the, the, the McCroom uh, massacre of the, the auxiliaries, um, Kill Michael, the British had not really taken the, the war, so to speak, seriously, nor had they taken the war in Iraq seriously. But after the ambush of the Manchester column, and the, the deaths of 200 soldiers. Um, they took the war very seriously indeed, and Winston Churchill even proposed using poison gas against the Iraqis, Iraqi villagers. And the reason that they didn't use uh, poison gas was not because of moral reasons, but the, for the logistical reasons, it didn't make sense. But what the British did do is they introduced um, free fire zones where using the RAF, where civilians would be killed. They bombed towns, um, and as people fled, they were machine-gunned. Even Winston Churchill was moved to object to the RAF, machine-gunning women and children who'd taken refuge in a lake. And what they also did, which is a standard imperialist tactic in, in, in India, in the northwest frontier, is to move into a village, destroy the houses, not just a few of the equivalent of Sinn Féin houses where you knock down the houses as in Ireland. They destroyed the villagers completely, Bull, bulldozed the lot and killed all the livestock and destroyed the grain stock. This is a war of attrition. Now, this is what the, the British were being moved to and they had decided, Eva, that, the, 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 that this was going to go down very badly, but they had also decided that the in, in unity and integrity of the empire was better than the public relations disaster. Now, there's not one person in this room, there's not one person in this room will approve of what they had in mind. But that's what they had in mind. They were imperialists, and none of us can understand the way the imperialist mind works. It's just not within our mental capacity. Well, they, yeah, it was in their minds, but they didn't do it. No, because yeah, they, that's they, the thing. They didn't do it because they knew they wouldn't have the support to do it. In their in their yeah, country, I here, I don't yeah. think so. I accept that's a problem, but I'm just saying we are dealing with a. Did, did yeah? Well, go on anyway. Well, Sorry, I, but well, I suppose there's a few things in in, in in this, and and you're right. The actions in Iraq and in the northwest frontier um, create kind of horrendous civilian casualties, but there is a for the British a racial distinction 
between the people that they're dealing with there and the people that they're dealing with in Ireland. And so the tactics that they would employ in Iraq were never going to be transferred here, and partly because they were quite able to cope, as you say, when, you know, when they began to take the war seriously. And in a six-month period, they were able to quite quickly, in many ways, create tactics that um, you know, most people claim are post-45 um, counterinsurgency tactics. They created small unit tactics. They were able to deploy planes here in some ways. They were able to use aerial reconnaissance, aerial photography for intelligence. So their campaign in Ireland is, is relatively sophisticated, and it's not what they do in, in, in the empire thing. It's much more closer to modern counterinsurgency theory than it would be to the imperial practice of the period. I take your point that they, they can be very, they were very brutal um, in, in Iraq. Um, and partly that's because of, well, of, of finances as well and because of a desire to give the RAF a role. But Trenchard himself, while delighting in his role in, 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 in Iraq and, and the, the kind of uh, opportunities it gives the RAF, is, uh, is, fights very hard to have the RAF excluded from operations in Ireland. He loses that eventually because Lloyd George kind of wants, I think, to make a point or at least raise the ante in Ireland a little bit. Um, but the, I think the British campaign in Ireland is, is very different. There are numerous refusals by British officers to serve here, which they would never have experienced in India or in North West Frontier or Iraq. So I think that they're just... They didn't need to do that kind of thing here. I think it's a much more nuanced conflict, often directed by Lloyd George and Churchill. They need to get to a particular settlement here. They have something in mind, which we kind of end up with. That's my point. And yeah. the, the, of course, I'm never saying I'm not saying that the the British were going to employ policies in Ireland like those that they were employed because they had a free hand in Iraq. There were no there were no journalists. And there were journalists here, and there were, there were lots of... Um, Commander Kenworthy in the House of Commons was making endlessly asking questions about the conduct of policy in, in Ireland. But in, 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 in the summer of 1921, um, they had 20 battalions being trained... 70 battalions, sorry. 70 battalions being trained for um, deployment in Ireland. And they, that would have been... But the entire country would have been produced under, under martial law. The Royal Navy was going to be deployed on a, a close inshore blockade. Banks were going to be closed. It was going to be a, a total war in the way that nobody could ever possibly have imagined now. But th th those were the plans. Se 70 battalions. Uh, the Royal Tank Corps were being deployed with um, wireless communications. You already adverted to um, or referred to Trenchard's use of the, 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 the Royal Air Force, and the Royal Air Force was going to be intimately uh, uh, connected to ta tanks using m mobile communication bases. And, and, and cavalry was going to be used as long-range stopping devices. It was going to be a really serious war. The, the, the people who capitulated in Downing Street did so for a good reason. I, I, I don't disagree that, that, yeah. the, that the Irish negotiating group or the Irish negotiators um, had to if you like, accept, accept the terms. I suppose what I mean is that the, this kind of warfare is highly political. What you're describing effectively would, wouldn't have been... Firstly, it, 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 it wouldn't work, wouldn't solve the political problem of the conflict, which is the Irish desire no, for infant. It but it, it, it simply wouldn't have been acceptable to the Americans or the French or to the British public. It just it wouldn't have been... It, it, you know, people present plans all the time to their superiors, and sometimes officers present a plan which is to frighten their superiors, <laughs> right? To say, well, you know, if you want to do this, this is what you're going to have to do. And then just to say to the politicians, okay, yeah, we're not going to do that. If that's what's going to take. So some plans are simply not credible military plans. They're simply done in a kind of over-the-top fashion. We have to, to step back from... Yeah, sorry. No, no, you're fine. Uh, can I bring in just, uh, we have a questioner over here, Some, there was somebody with their hand up a moment ago. Um, anyone? Oh, no, don't the not. Just one second, just one second. Is there any, no? Okay, Mr. Kelleher, I think. Just identify yourself for the audience when you're speaking. Audience are allowed to take mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just wondering, 
in favour of independence. I think we'd all accept that. But what did the British government do? They didn't accept it. They rejected it. And then they started bringing in the black and tans and the auxiliaries and all that type of thing. And they gave the world an impression that the wild Irish are causing problems between themselves. We, we as a nation, surely, as a nation, surely, we have the right to govern ourselves. We're being denied that right. That's that's a huge problem, isn't it? I mean, I, I I feel I feel very 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 upset about this. That there we had there we had an opportunity, of of a possibility of 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 solving the Irish problem, as known as the Irish problem, where the majority of the people vote in favour of independence. And very shortly afterwards, what did they do? They went along and they they passed the government of Ireland the, the government of Ireland Act and set up partition. Who did they consult? Where did they get the mandate? What mandate did they, did they get to partition Ireland? Ireland had never been partitioned, as you know, as we all know here. It had never been partitioned, and it shouldn't be partitioned. And the other point, just, just on, on one thing, some people might have thought from earlier that I was something at a gripe with Protestants. I have no gripe with Protestants whatsoever. I've always maintained that in a united Ireland, the, the Protestant population would have a huge contribution to make. There's no doubt about that. They would have a huge contribution to make in the United Ireland. They have very little influence in the British Parliament, even though they have a bit at the moment with the DUP. But apart from that, leaving that aside for a moment, they would have a very, very strong contribution to make to, 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 our, to our, our society. But again, getting back to it, and I think this is terribly important, that surely the panel must agree that we have the right to govern ourselves as a nation. David. Well, um, question is, who are we? What is the nation? And that's what we've, a lot of our discussions have concerned this very point, that there is no such thing as the Irish nation, never has been. There have been a large number of people who have lived in Ireland, who have different views. Uh, and the great problem is always to find a way of making life better for the people who live in Ireland, which is fair to the different sub-communities within that country. So that is the problem which was faced by the British government. That's the problem which was faced by the Redmondites. How do you find a fair solution, to use that term that Roy uh, used last night, a fair solution? And uh, Nobody came up, it, it, there is no simple fair solution. I mean, a, a vote ostensibly for uh, full independence in 1918 does not mean that the entire population of Ireland um, had to be dragooned into a particular constitution, that of a republic. It was a statement that the majority of voters were prepared to pursue a republic in the hope of getting some measure of freedom but what measure of freedom they expected differed immensely from one section of the nationalist population to another. And no solution, no constitutional change, which failed to take account of minority interests, um, would be fair and acceptable. And I think that is what um, made it so incredibly difficult and, and continues to do so. It's not a simple matter of a majority, um, voting in a particular direction and thus providing a permanent mandate for one simple solution. That is bound to be at the cost of others. Anyone else on the panel want to come on? You don't have to. So we can well, I don't think it. Kevin was suggesting that we, we can't govern or we, we don't have a right to govern ourselves. I don't think that was the... the no, the, if the, that was the implication, it's my, if I said from the outset I was a Redmondite, Redmondite is just um, it's a shorthand term for seeking a constitutional settlement with Britain without the use of violence. Um, just as a matter of fact, uh, the, 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 the Sinn Féin vote in, in, in 1918 was 47% of, of the, the electorate. Um, I, I do understand the deep sense of, of bitterness and betrayal 
of Irish nationalists, of which, which number I would include myself, at um, the unbelievable um, destruction, so, so close to realisation of home rule by uh, armed dissent. There is nothing more dangerous in a community when you arm people according to their religion or their beliefs, and that's what happened in, in the north, and we have, that's irreversible damage, irreversible damage, and it's, it's entirely logical and human for those people who had striven for generations for self-government, for full sovereignty of the Irish people, to have that real prospect, as they saw, stolen from underneath their eyes by... Um, Illegal. It was. It was. It was the only questionably uh, legal importation of arms, um, and that's poisoned the relations between uh, unionists and, and and nationalists. I mean, which was already fraught. But once I say you arm opinions, then the results are deadly for all, as we've now discovered. No, I, I, I've just said it's not. And I, I, it is quite, quite clearly a violation, not merely of democracy, but of ordinary rules of decent society. If you arm people according to their politics and their religion, you are creating the circumstances for war, and the, uh, so civil war. And the British government was not prepared to take on, nor did they have the military will, nor the military willpower to, to, to do that. And I'm not sure anyone ever has been able to resolve the issue of unionist resistance to um, uh, independent Ireland. I am conscious, however, in so far that I have been doing an awful lot more talking than the other participants, so I'd rather be a little bit right. silent at this point. I suppose I just, one thing I suppose it was from conversations we had earlier on today, and it, 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 it's not to deny our right to a nation or anything like that, but if we based our opposition to the right, that we have an entirely separate identity from the British identity, right? We have a right to secede, right, and govern ourselves. How then can we deny unionists the right to secede from us if it's a principle? So, you know, that's my point, is that, that, you know, that if you secede from a nation, you can't then, or not, if you secede from the union at the time, and we say we are a separate people, but, in, but a right and, a, and a, an authority to govern ourselves, then how can you turn around to unionists and say, well, you can't secede from us because it's a territorial thing. It's not about identity. Whereas we were demanding to be removed on the basis of identity. Now, back to the floor. Gentleman here with the glasses. Hi there, uh, my name's Karen Doyle. <clears throat> in 2017, I sometimes wonder what the Republic means in the Republic of Ireland, what it stands for. I'd just love to know what you, your opinion is on what maybe the common volunteer or even a common person back in during that period understood what republicanism was or what a republic stood for outside of being probably anti-monarchy, what did it mean to people? Or did they have an idea? Eve? Well, do, uh, do you mean people who were in the, vo the Irish volunteers and the, and the IRA, or do you just mean in general? Well, people in general, I'm not going to... I mean, I'm not going to come... In terms, in terms of, of the Irish volunteers and the IRA, I mean, the, 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 I mean and, and the ordinary volunteers, you see, the thing is, is that we don't really actually know that much about the rank and file of the IRA or, the, uh, or um, the Irish volunteers. We know a little bit, okay, and we know more than we did now with the Bureau of Military History, and, and we're getting more information now as if they applied for military service pensions. But to be honest with you, the vast majority of people who, who got pensions were officers of one sort or another. There was only a very small minority of ordinary volunteers. So in a way, it's a very good question and kind of an unanswerable one because... You know, without sources. But do we know anything from local authority meeting minutes or letters to the editors? Or well, I mean, I think, like I think, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think David was right when he said earlier that people had all, all sort. There wasn't one unified goal among uh, Irish Republicans or nationalists, or the, and that was the whole point. That's how. That's that's why Sinn Fein worked, is because they say, right, okay, you know, we want to, you know. We want a republic or we want our freedom. We'll decide precisely what that means after we get it, right? So they never had to address the question. So people could actually, you know, they could, they could, they, they could believe whatever they wanted to believe about what the republic... And, and in that sense, it's not very surprising that when 
but you finally had to start making decisions about what Ireland was going to look like and negotiating treaties and things like that, that, pe that, that, that trouble, the split started to rise because you have to start making real decisions. It's no, no longer this, this republic floating around in the sky that everybody's fighting for. It's this real practical situation and all these, uh, these different viewpoints that we've had between you know, people who are former Redmondites, people who are unionists, people, you know, even people within, the, within uh, the Republican movement suddenly have all these different ideas and they have to make a decision. And, and it wasn't that easy, you know, as we saw, there was a civil war. So. Yeah. Well, I, I would, I, in my opinion, most so-called Republicans didn't want a republic. Uh, I think the, the slogan of the Republic was one chosen for American audience because it was believed that in order to gain respect abroad and uh, to be able to, to find supporters in the United States and Australia and elsewhere and not have to rely on politicians in Britain to bring about Irish independence of some kind or other, that the only way to mobilize that international support was through a Republican propaganda campaign. And it's perfectly obvious that most of the leaders of that campaign did so because they thought it the most effective means of propaganda. That if you went to, to try to, to raise funds or to get congressional support in the United States, and you said, look, what we'd really like is to have a partial arrangement for home rule with an exemption for a number of counties in various areas, and we'd like you to give, you, give we want $10 million to do that, please. Um, they would have been laughed out of court. They, already the Redmondites had, of course, raised funds. But in order to gain significant international support, particularly in the context of the post-war world reorganization, the only way to do it was to make a strong, uncompromising claim, uh, as every other nationality was trying to do, uh, you know, to the Paris Peace Conference and elsewhere. Now, to me, then, that is a slogan. It is quite obvious to me that de Valera, for example, was never a Republican and made that perfectly clear uh, in the way that he approached um, the self-determination campaign. Uh, it's clear to me that Collins was not a Republican. I don't think Harry Boland was a Republican. All of these people supported the Republic because they thought it was a marketable proposal. It could work. And they had a, a they, it might have worked even at the peace conference. But what do you think about what he was saying, sorry, about, about the rank and file, which I think was part of his question? Yes, I, I think that... Because the, you're talking about the leadership. I'm talking about the difference between achieving some sort of a sense of freedom and self-determination on the one hand and pursuing a complete break. That is what a republic appears to entail uh, on the other hand. And I think in this sense, the leadership on the whole was in tune with the general public. They had different views about what the, the best constitutional outcome would be. But above all, they perceived that these differences had to be postponed uh, until they had achieved something, a compromise. Could I, um, briefly if you can. I, I think that the nature of the ambition of the volunteer movement became quite evident with the reciting of the rosary throughout the GPO, throughout the siege of the GPO and um, the um, other uh, places of 1916 and thereafter one of the, 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 one of the files about the executions that Kim Bielenberg, uh, sorry, uh, him is his brother, and, um, and uh, Andy Bielenberg uh, referred to, they, they all said a, a decade of the rosary before they, they executed the man um, and they put a rosary around his hands. But the, the the occasion which I think, which shows up the ambiguity of within the whole Republican movement occurred on St. Patrick's Day in 1923 in Cork Barracks, when under a radio command from General Richard Mulcahy in Dublin, Major General David Reynolds raised a tricolour over Cork Barracks. Sewn onto the tricolour was a sacred heart sewn by the, the Société des Oeuvres des, uh, um, des Sacré-Cœurs of Lyon. This was an organisation formed 
1871 by Bishop Fourier. Uh, it was anti-Republican. It was specifically founded to refute republicanism and all its pomps and its evils. He, Fourier maintained that the reason why France had lost the, the war with Prussia in 1870 was because of republicanism. So here we have in the heartland of Republican Ireland. This is where most of the War of Independence was fought and the worst bits were fought. You had a flag with one side the Republic and the other side the Sacred Heart. And over the next 50 years, which side of the flag prevailed in the conduct of governance in mm -hmm. Ireland? And we can see that quite simply. Okay. by the nature of the society that merged. Okay, let's go back to the floor. Anyone else? I'm here, the gentleman in the second row. What does... Can you identify yourself? Uh, John Leonard is my name. Okay. Uh, in, would people of uh, 1916, 1922 have joined the EU? Uh, and how would that have fitted into their, <laughs> their thinking? Barry? Um, again, I suppose we're going off to kind of like speculate and it's kind of counterfactual history. I honestly have no idea what the, um, the guys in, in, in the GPO would have done in terms of um, 1916. Although, following up from Kevin said over there, I think that they, um, I remember hearing Gareth Fitzgerald once saying that they were picking out which German prince that they would yes. make King of Ireland, right? So, I mean, I think that they weren't uh, you know, it depends on what part of Europe they were going to be asked to ally with. <laughs> and, we're, you know, we're not good allies of the Germans anyway, so it's all worked out very fine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I think they're... Going back to the thing, I think that there is a, a, a core of kind of Republican belief in that movement. I think that the criticisms that are made are quite right. The, I don't think that it really... In my sense of it, in, in the reading of it, it's not really true across the rank and file, but we don't know. Um, but... It's from my point of view, looking at it from a counterinsurgency point of view, Irish Republican was less robust than some of the other ideologies that emerged post forty five. Mm -hmm. But going back to twenty two again, I've got, you know, I've I've no idea because okay. the, the EU simply just that kind of concept didn't David? exist. Well, I, I think that love of Europe actually was the other side of the coin of um, mm. hatred of Britain, and always has been. I mean, um, to be simply anglophobic is an ugly attitude and very limiting. It's, it's insulting, in fact, for uh, any people to limit themselves to negative views of another country. And so from a very early stage, uh, Irish nationalism has been associated with a cosmopolitan view in which Europe has played a highly favorable role as an alternative, that the world is not just a matter of uh, polarized, of, of the Irish way and the British way. Um, and so I think actually they w if there had been any, if there had been a Europe, rather than the, the smouldering fragments of a Europe in 1919, uh, that would have been a very attractive alternative for Irish nationalists. Kevin? Well, um, much of the um, current EU um, was at war with Britain in 1914-18, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, where well, that would include Croatia, um, much of Poland, and of course uh, the, the German Empire. So you could say that, I'd agree with others here that there would have been uh, a favorable attitude towards um, European Union but I did say at the very beginning of this I don't believe in counterfactual history I just throw that in but it's I don't think there's, a, there's no way, there's no way we can resolve sure. that one okay any questioners from this side of the hall you're being remarkably quiet for West Cork down here where sorry big part yes microphone here <coughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Kirsten Marnane. I, uh, so a question from a woman at last, um, and it's about women. <laughs> about women. Um, I was really moved by Dr. Morrison's story this morning of uh, Margaret Noble. And so my question to the panel is, um, what other women of, in history have, have formed the history of West Cork? Who's interesting to you and why? Eve? 
Uh, do, do you mean live women or, or, or <laughs> dead women? Do you just mean, I mean, uh, do you just mean in general? Okay, well, I only know about the revolutionary period, and actually I know more about the IRA than I do about coming them on. However, uh, I, I mean, I actually, like, like uh, so I'll just answer what I know, which is, which is basically, I mean, I suppose, like, like uh, the um, Cork, the, the coming them on, uh, was exceptionally well organized and active in Cork during uh, during the revolutionary period. They were they were as you know they were they weren't allowed to uh, take part directly in the fighting, but they did a lot of, of logistical support. Um, and so and they were much and, and they but but they worked very closely with the columns in a way that I think uh, that they didn't in a in a um, in other parts of the country, uh, and and so and and w so it was one of the real sad things about the Bureau of Military History is that they only interviewed like fourteen women from from Cork or less, and this is like and this is where coming among was the most organised, and it was it, it, it um and it was because it was a lot of it was because they preferred uh, investigators to interview for a female to investigator. To, to uh, interview the women rather than than the men, and there was and the lady who was doing the interviewing of it didn't like travelling, so that they didn't. <laughs> and it was uh, it was really as as simple as, as that. So, but but uh, um, but I think now with the military service pensions uh, that are being released, you have for the first time really, um, uh, you know, a, an enormous amount of evidence about what the women were doing in Cork during the revolution. Actually, just for a plug, there's a local, uh, I've, I've got a, uh, an article that's talking about the organization of Cumann Amon and the IRA in West Cork that's coming out in uh, the copying, it's, it's the, the local historical journal that's, that's edited by Colm Cronin. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really bad at remembering titles, but it's that and it's, it's the next issue. I have something about that when people are interested. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Any interesting contributions from the rest of you? Well, well I think one of the the, 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 the pleasant and the, the useful byproducts of extending our documentation is that some of the sources, like compensation files, mm. are extremely revealing about ordinary women and the impact on them of violence. Um, so that's a, an area where we need to look more. I mean, it's all very well to say, oh, uh, only three women were actually murdered by the IRA. But how many women, most of the other women lost husbands um, or fathers uh, or brothers. So uh, in the chron more and more we're getting interested in victimhood in the Irish Revolution. That's been obvious from our discussions here. And that is uh, something in which women are at least as much affected as men. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my particular hero or heroine, in, since the question is interesting, um, is uh, Mrs. Lindsay. Um, she did the right thing. She wanted no lives to be lost. She gave a warning to the IRA that she was going to send her coachman to, or her driver to the RIC that, to inform them that an ambush was going to take place. They should have dispersed. They didn't disperse. They didn't believe the warning. We all know what happened. The ambush, the RIC turned up. IRA men were killed. I can't remember how many. But it wasn't her fault. She tried to stop violence. And um, we have seen so much violence, I mean, useless violence, that uh, has not advanced the cause of civilization or humanity or unity one bit. And, you know, we, everyone talks about Countess Markovitz, or so-called Countess Constance Markovitz, she wasn't a Countess, that she has been a, a heroic figure in the, the, the contemplations of 1916, to my mind, an infinitely greater woman because she was prepared to take the risk to save human life, was Mary Lindsay. Barry? Um, <laughs> I think I, um, it's, because I suppose the nature of my work is more military history, so it, I would echo, I think, David's comments in terms of we, we're becoming more interested in the victims of the conflict, but as a military historian, what strikes me is really odd about the history of the Irish conflict in this period is that there is, all wars generate sexual violence against women, okay? Uh, widespread in every conflict. It's not absent from any conflict. And yet, there is a kind of remarkable silence in Ireland about that during the period. And, you know, I'm not picking one group or one uh, set of participants here over the other. I just mean that 
that is a research agenda that I think I would like to see more work done in. Just a, a question for me, if I may take the luxury. You hear in contemporary politics people on the left saying that the politicians of today, the establishment of today, and many of the people of today have betrayed the uh, honour of the men of 19, and women of 1916 and that we did not create the republic for which they died. What evidence is there that people who were involved in 1916 and later fundamentally wanted to overturn the economic model as distinct from the political model? that existed. You got it first, yeah. David. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the, the, the leaders of the rebellion in 1916 were of different minds when it came to economic and social questions. Um, that the proclamation gave surprisingly great attention to this Mm. partly because of Connolly's late enrollment um, in part of the rebel coalition. Um, and I, I think that we should not think that this was... It, it's wrong to think of the proclamation as a reliable guide to the ideology of this very small group who organised a rising or rebellion. It's even more wrong, therefore, to suppose that those who followed them and who organised a vastly more effective movement, both political propagandist and military in later times, yeah. that they betrayed the legacy of the leaders of 1916. Yeah. Uh, they created, the, the leaders of 1916 were theorizing. They were of different opinions. They wrote down a beautiful sounding proclamation, but it meant nothing because there was not the slightest possibility of its being put into practical operation. The point is that their successors created something uh, even during the revolutionary period and administration where they had to face social and economic facts. They made compromises even before 1921. They continued to make them afterwards. But they are compromises based on practical experience mm -hmm. and the possibility of doing something. I think it's a dreadful error to go back to that proclamation and say, oh, my God, if only we had followed the sage if. advice of our founders. No, I actually I would agree with most okay. of what David said. I don't Barry? Say. Yeah, I would uh, agree with it as well. I, d I don't think that when you... It's what I think David said earlier, you, you try and put yourself in various mindsets and on uh, one side or the other, but I don't see... It's very easy to understand what communist insurgents want in an economic system. But it's less... You know, it's very clear, but from, uh, from the period 1916 to 22, there isn't really a clarity about any kind of economic model or plan. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. There isn't... Uh, the economics isn't a, a fundamental part of, 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 of the rising. What is a fundamental part is, is Catholicism, even... Connolly, I'm having to depend on my memory here, um, said that like mankind before Calvary, there is no redemption without bloodshed. He, he went to the GPO as a Catholic, not as a Marxist. He, he was like David Reynolds in Cork um, barracks in 1923, torn in two different directions. And his direction was one Marxist, two Catholic. And on this occasion, and up to the time of his execution, it was Catholicism which triumphed. Okay. We we'll take one last uh, round of questions. Just bear with it for the microphone. Okay. Um, I Do you want to identify? Uh, I don't know quite sure, uh, I think the partition of Ireland was a gerrymander, like David mentioned there about Ulster. It wasn't Ulster. Ulster actually, it was six counties. They used that like so they'd have a majority. Like so, uh, David also said like that majorities don't count in the 1918 uh, general election. What do, what do majorities count for? Well, they, they had an artificial majority. They had a major, an artificial majority in the six counties of Ireland. What about the consent of the people that lived there, of the nationalist people? Say they lived in the six. They didn't have their consent. So where do where do majorities stand in that sort of circumstances? So if we're taking that as a, as a general theory, the other thing, like is uh, you you mentioned, uh, Kevin mentioned that um, 26 counties was a kind of a failed entity. What about the six counties where you had conflict for over three or four generations? pogroms, military conflict, and so on. I mean, there, it's a failed entity. It hasn't succeeded. Like, and I mean, presently you have, you have ongoing negotiations, which is better than warlike. So like, the South has fa is failed in, ma in many ways, but there was never kind of conflict or a military conflict. In the six counties, you had military conflict, okay. and you had a suprem a supremacy. It was based on supremacy, okay. where, one, where one tribe lorded over the other. 
All right, let's get to the panel. Yeah, Eve? I, um, I don't see, I'm not comfortable with describing Southern Ireland as a failed entity. Did you say I that? Didn't say that. Oh, so, I didn't say that. I didn't, I mean, because the thing is, Ireland... Oh, right, yeah, no, no, I mean, because the thing is, I think people make a lot of assumptions about, uh, you know, yes, there was lots of unemployment, yes, there was emigration, and they didn't manage to solve those problems. But I, I think it's actually going too far to say that the majority of people in Southern Ireland were devastated by the settlement, all right? I think it, may, it mightn't have been what everybody thought they were going to get at the beginning, but, I think, but, but if you look at what happened, Ireland was a very stable place. Uh, post-Civil War, it, it, it became very stable very quickly after the Civil War. It was, I think, the only, maybe somebody can correct me, the only new state founded after the, after the First World War that survived as a democracy, however conservative a democracy it was, that it was. And, and that in itself is a real achievement when you look at what was going on elsewhere in interwar Europe and what eventually happened in this in the, in the second world. So I actually don't, this is actually, it's interesting, it's, it's come up, this idea that the southern state was a failed entity has come up before, and I think it's something that um, when you want to knock it, that people, I'm not saying that that's what you did, I don't, because I agree, I don't, I don't think that that's your point, and, but see the problem, uh, but the, yeah, well, I mean, I think there's more of an argument to be, to be said that, that, that certainly that, 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 the, that the six counties, I, I don't know if everybody would agree with you, what, 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 uh, didn't certainly, I'm not saying it was inevitable for it to, to fail, but, you know, from, from the words up, but, it, but it, 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 it just, a lot of what happened subsequently in terms of the way it was governed just meant that the problems that were there were never solved and that they never managed to, I mean, just like in, in, um, bef you know, in, in the lead up to before the War of Independence, nobody ever managed to convince enough unionists to come that, that a 32 county Ireland would be a good idea. All right. The, the northern state never managed to convince enough, nor you know, northern Catholics that remaining in Northern Ireland and being part of Northern Ireland was a good idea. Yeah. All right? right? So, okay, well, you maybe yeah, I mean, agree, disagree. No, no, I don't. If anybody looking back on the history of Northern Ireland in the mid-1960s from outside mm. would probably have said this is not a failed entity. It may be an inequitable state. It may uh, uh, suppress the progress of its Catholic minority, but it actually works. It, it works by getting a very large subvention from the imperial treasury, um, by applying all of the latest social reforms two or three years late, uh, introduced by other Tory or Labour governments. Um, uh, there's a modus vivendi, although not a happy one, between majority and minority. So we look back from a period of following a conspicuous failure. Mm. Um, but that would not have been the view of most observers in the 1960s. And partition was brought in in the hope that it would simplify things, that you would basically give, divide up arbitrarily, or fairly arbitrarily, the area of Ireland into two entities, each of which would have a relatively containable minority, yeah. which is the antithesis of good democracy, as I've been saying before, that a fair solution involves not just paying heed to the majority, but also the minority. Um, but there were, those even in the, there were those in the free state who saw the continuing problem of Northern Ireland, not simply as bigotry on the part of the Unionist administration, but as a failure, as an incomprehension on the part of most free state leaders of the mentality of Ulster Unionists. Mm. Um, and Ernest Blythe, who was by far the best informed uh, of all free state ministers when it came to Northern Ireland for all sorts of reasons, including his uh, early membership at the Orange Order, um, Ernest Blythe, uh, almost alone, pursued an attempt to re-educate both nationalists and unionists. He felt the only way eventually to end partition was to somehow convince the minority in each case that of one's bona fides uh, and goodwill, and that that entailed stopping anti-partition propaganda um, stopping any threats of coercion or economic boycotts and so on. Now, that sort of approach, which is so much peace process mm. type right. approach to a solution, if only others had taken it up, mm -hmm. seen that the problem of the minority is not to kick it, but to 
to help it. Uh, and to do that, you need to educate the majority into tolerance. Without that view, progress would never be com complete. Yeah, just to um, amplify on Can David's you? point. I'm just going to ask okay. um, If you looked back, and I have never said and do not believe that the 26 counties are a failed state, but they have done, the people who administered the state administered really, really badly, shamefully, disgracefully a violation of all the norms of civilization. We had the highest level of censorship of any free society in the world. In, in, in 1954, five and a half thousand books were banned, or had been banned, and the Minister for Justice actually boasted about that. But in 1926, by 1926, between 1926 and 1961, start again, between 1926 and 1961, the population of Northern Ireland rose by 168,000. The po proportion of the Catholic population of Northern Ireland rose from 37.5% to 34.9%. So the Catholic population actually rose in Northern Ireland proportionately. The Republic's population over that period <laughs> fell by 154,000. And um, the uh, Catholic population of the three border counties, Donegal, Monaghan and Cavan, fell by 60,000. And the majority of those would have been Catholics. So this, if you were a unionist looking at independent Ireland from the vantage point of 1961, you would have said that those who stayed with the union did the right thing. The majority of people born in the 26 counties by 1968 were living abroad. Okay. And that's a terrible, terrible indictment of how the government of independent okay. Ireland was administered. Okay, we'll take one final question from the gentleman in the green. Okay. Just in the front, front row. There was a, there was a lady back right there who said you had her hand. Is she? Where? Just there. My name is Brendan Moriarty, and uh, I was born in West Cork, but now I live in the north of Ireland. So a fair few <coughs> north and south. You know, I've really got sick of all the criticism we've had here, of these men of violence. Why are they referred to always? To most people, I think, they're patriots. At the time of all this trouble, we had a very different Ireland. We were very poor. The people emigrating, poverty, poverty. And these men, they got up and they said, we're going to do something about it. And they did. Mm -hmm. the England in trouble say what you like, but they did it. And I have relatives who fought in that period. I don't see them as men of us. I see them as patriots. They were trying to do something. There's a lady here, she's a close relative of, uh, of uh, Thomas Ash. But you know, all this talk of just the men of violence, just the men of violence, and what's wrong? And you know, we did have a civil war, but just shortly afterwards, the two sides, they get together, they govern the country. As you say, we were the one people, north of the Alps, that have just stuck together and stay together. Mm -hmm. And you know, the north of Ireland, I'm living there. 50 and years. 50 years. And I've watched it. And listen, it's appalling what's going on there. The housing there of just no Catholic, they just didn't. The Catholics didn't even expect to get a house. And it wasn't just, it was in Fermanagh, it was in Fermanagh. Mm -hmm. But where I blame a lot is that everyone knew what was going on in Derry, everybody knew what was going on in Belfast and Newry, they knew it was gerrymandered, that they knew. But neither the English government or the Irish government did anything at all mm -hmm. about it. But then, when the people there rose up, oh, they said, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't. But these people were in a bad situation. And just like here in the 1900s, the early 20th century, they tried to okay. do something about it there. Now, I'm not condoning the IRA or violence. Right. But at the same time, I think that these men, we are living in a pretty good Ireland now. Things okay. are not so do bad. Hear, do you want to hear from the, any of the panel? Kevin. I think you've made your point. Yeah, you've made your point. Yeah. Barry? Um, well, yeah, I am, I've made, you've made your point. I mean, I think that, that, you know, in terms of motivation, no one is questioning sort of people's patriotism. It's the 
I suppose, the choice to go to war, or the, the, which is what Kevin was questioning um, earlier on. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we've debated a little bit about their vision, and, and you were talking about that they were trying to end poverty and so on, but, you know, the, the, the proof of that would have been in the, the remaining 50 years, as Kevin and David pointed out, which didn't kind of happen, really. Um, and, you know, look, there are men of violence in, in every country, and some wear uniforms and some don't. And um, we're, we're, I'm not, um, I don't approach my kind of analysis of the period in Ireland in that way. I don't take that kind of stance on either group. I'm just trying to, as David said, I'm trying to analyse their actions and see what they lead to. Um, but we're not... I've never used the term men of violence. No, neither have I. I've, I've, I've I haven't actually heard. I have actually haven't heard the phrase um, during the course of the last it. day. I haven't used it. You know, I mean, no, nobody here on, on this on the table has used that phrase at any point. No, they haven't. I mean, to be fair, no. I'm t I'm told that we need to clear out of here for an hour. Um, there's a lady just standing. Sorry, there, there's, there's one. There's one who has had her hand up for quite some time. Okay, no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Now, I wasn't here this morning for Dr. Edwards' um, presentation, so I'm sorry about that. But I would just like, I would appreciate the view of the panel with regard to what he was saying. I know you're speaking about more recent history, but going back to what was described as the Great Earl, um, how great was he for the people who were living in the country at the time, given he was described by Dr. Edwards as an adventurer with land-grabbing intentions and activities. Well, I think the, the historical expertise of the panel might be 400 years later. Yeah. But does oh, anybody no. have a quick yeah. contribution? No, I mean, I, no. it's no. not my area. Not our area. No, it's okay. not our, our topic either. And not the topic. We're talking about the War of Independence. I'm afraid we can't add anything to that. Confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yes, we have a missing coat. So, yeah, yeah it's... Should right, we try um, to, should we try to get one more question on the topic? Um, well, yeah, do we have a final question on the topic, on the topic? East Donegal, and uh, would be of the Protestant descent. A few things I would say to some of the audience that I hear talking here today is that uh, uh, I think generally along the border, and that's the whole border, the 500 kilometres of it that I hear this exists, uh, I would say most of the Protestants would be glad that the state of Northern Ireland exists now. And I personally do. And I, I personally don't know of any Protestant uh, that wouldn't have that, say that, mightn't say it openly, but would say it in a forum where they were, thought they were safe enough to say it. Uh, I think most political people and historians here that are talking about that should reflect on that statement. And I would like to hear the views of it, but it's more for the benefit of, the, I think, some of the people in the audience okay. tonight there. Any contributions from the panel, finally, on that? Well, just, I think that's a very interesting point to raise. Um, it shows we have to get away from the question of whether a state is legitimate in its origins or otherwise. And the point is that every state in the world is illegitimate, you could say, at one level. There's no reason why the lands of our earth have been carved up uh, and given into certain, uh, passed into the power of certain groups. So I, I dismiss the general notion of legitimate occupancy. Mm. Um, so the question is, do states work? And after they've existed for some time and power structures have developed, um, are they accepted by the majority of their citizens and is there sufficient tolerance of the minority of their citizens. So I think we should forget about uh, outrage at six counties and just think, well, did it work or didn't it work? And there's disagreements on that. Eve? And so I, so there was, no, I thought what you said was, was, uh, was very... Because uh, I think the implication behind what you were saying is that lots of, lots of Protestants wouldn't feel safe. Sorry, sorry, no, uh, or what... campaign in Donegal said that, uh, and I basically agree with this, and that the Irish state 
was a, a, a Catholic state or a state for a Catholic people set up from 1921. That's the way it evolved. And that's the way uh, that it has evolved, right? I'm proud to be Irish, but I do uh, have certain, obviously, concerns that I hear permanently about the state, the state, or the six counties, or the whatever. Mm. Uh, I think the argument has been played out, and I don't want to get into a situation where I'm saying that one thing justifies another, because nothing ever justifies, uh, you know, violence at any stage, and I don't uh, justify violence. And I'm glad that the electorate and the Protestant electorate in Northern Ireland do not vote for men of violence okay. or people associated with violence. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed. It's been a fascinating hour and a half. Um, and <laughs> And, and, thank, and thank all of you particularly for the courtesy with which the debate was conducted, because I think that is uh, particularly impressive. And tomorrow, everybody's back here at 11 for a panel session on the First World War in Ireland, uh, including Kevin Vickers, a Canadian ambassador, and we have to hope that there is nobody who is going to attempt an assault upon him. Um, and then uh, we have um, uh, another panel session at noon, uh, also on the First World War in Ireland. So yet again... A very busy day, and we hope to see all of you again. Thank you.